Hello, Bob. How you doing? Hi, Glenn. Good to talk to you. Good to talk with you. This is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv, uh, sponsored by the Watson Institute for Public and International Affairs at Brown University, where I'm a professor. And I have the pleasure now of talking with Robert Cherry, who's professor of economics at uh, Brooklyn College City University of New York. Uh, Bob and I are friends. We've known each other for a while. We've done conversations here at The Glenn Show in the past. Um, and uh, Bob works on issues of uh, social policy, labor economics, and so on, uh, involving anti-poverty efforts and so on, um, often with an eye toward uh, uh, trying to get a deeper understanding of the disadvantaged circumstances of low-income African Americans, uh, not only them, but, but them included, and uh, has uh, a lot of interesting things to say on that subject. So a lot of courageous things to say on that subject, too. a lot of curmudgeonly things <laughs> to say on that subject. Uh, Bob, you and I are of a similar age. I'm not telling if you don't. But uh, I sometimes feel like I'm out of it, you know, like I have somehow uh, missed. I didn't get the memo. Times have shifted. Uh, the, the, the popular narrative moves on, and I keep saying the same stuff that I was saying 30 years ago. You ever get that feeling? Well, 30 years ago, I was saying really different stuff. So uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was a committed leftist. Okay, uh, I so, see. <laughs> uh, but I think what hasn't changed is that I really try to keep a focus on public policy. Uh, I'm a, a committed reformist now. And, uh, you know, that's what I, I think is really lacking in the public discourse is a, a serious discussion of ways to reform uh, the situation, uh, particularly at risk black Americans face. How do we revitalize their neighborhoods? How do we uh, close the public school edu educational achievement gap? How do we deal with uh, the chronic uh, large numbers of young men who are disconnected from school or the labor market, uh, you know, that's what uh, drives me. And uh, I think, unfortunately, it isn't what drives a lot of the public discourse. Okay. Um, let's stay at this general level for a moment before we get down a little bit into some more specific stuff. What's wrong with the discourse, and, and, and where do you see the real opportunities to make progress against this problem of entrenched uh, inequality, a lack of social mobility, especially as it affects uh, low-income African Americans? Well, I, I think, you know, any reasonable discourse has to take seriously that at least a share of the problem are behavioral deficits within the black community. Whether or not they're adaptations from uh, structural racism, which certainly ex exists, uh, they have to be dealt with on their own terms. Uh, you can't simply say, if we somehow deal with structural racism, uh, those things will wash out. Uh, and you know, it's sort of complicated, I think, on the left, because on the one hand, while they say we have to focus on structural reforms, you know, the, the thrust of this white supremacist narrative is that you can't do anything in this society because uh, the structural barriers are uh, deeply entrenched and uh, it's sort of hopeless to change them. Uh, so, there, so there's not a very constructive dialogue because of, of, uh, of this. How do you know that they're wrong, the people who say that structure first before you get to behavior? Uh, how do you know they're wrong? Well, because, you know, we live, uh, if you look at many of the urban cities, uh, Chicago, Baltimore, New York, et cetera, Detroit, you know, they have been run by liberal Democrats for 40 years who have been attempting, at least they say, 
to rectify these inequalities, and yet they persist. And by some measures, uh, in terms of family disorganization, may be stronger than they were 40 years ago. So, I mean, if if people who run these cities, and they've had money, it isn't like for most of these years, these cities were absent funds, uh, then there must be something else going on. And yes, uh, there certainly are things that can be done beyond trying to uh, look at ways to help black Americans, uh, particularly at risk, overcome uh, behavioral deficits. But, uh, you know, this 40-year this history of urban America just leads me to believe that uh, structural uh, barriers are not uh, the primary obstacle that uh, we have to overcome. Okay. I can see a person saying it might have been worse if we hadn't... They, a person might concede that the record of... Uh, since the great society of initiatives aimed at uh, from uh, wars on poverty to model cities to uh, welfare and welfare reform to uh, criminal justice reform to liberal ideas and educational policy to identity politics and we could go on. I could see a person saying, okay, okay, maybe the record isn't so great. True enough, Democrats have been in charge in all these cities that you've named for decades, generations, and things are not so great, but maybe they would have been worse. Uh, can you tell me what's wrong with what we've been doing? And can you tell me what you have credible uh, evidence to suggest would be a better alternative way of proceeding? Well, first of all, it certainly could be true that uh, on balance, these programs have helped modestly, but it's hard to believe that if we continue to redirect energies in that direction, there'll be anything but diminishing returns. So uh, that's the first point. Uh, It's time to try something new. The the second point is that these behavioral deficits, I think, can be dealt with in a pretty constructive way. Specifically, I'm not a big fan of saying, well, all we have to do is, is uh, end the out-of-wedlock uh, birth rates, that somehow we should, uh, one way or another, uh, get more black men and women to marry and adopt uh, what have been called bourgeois values. Uh, I don't think it's realistic to recreate uh, family structures uh, among the working class and poor. Uh, you know, maybe it could happen, but I, but I think you, there's no way to directly kind of try to implement something. But what you can do is give counseling and resources that are directed within the family when kids are young, uh, up through 10 years old, where you help these trying families navigate uh, the problems that they face. And I think we can be more hopeful because many women 15 to 20 years ago were very vulnerable. There was a scarcity of black men uh, because of incarceration, and uh, women had to hook up with the many who were problematic and because they had limited education, limited independent income. And so you had very testing relationships, but given how much educational advancement for black women has occurred, you know, they don't any longer have to put up with problematic men. 
that they did in the past. And also, I think there has been a, uh, there's more men available because there has been a substantial decline in incarceration rates. So they, there's more choice. Uh, and also the men, I think, uh, are m much more sensitive to being well-behaved, particularly as fathers. I mean, certain fatherhood programs, I think, have been uh, particularly effective. I, you know, I looked a little at those that were for in prison reentry programs. Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of hopeful that this kind of more directed focus at getting resources directly into the family, uh, support resources, counseling, when kids are young, uh, building on these fatherhood programs uh, can be effective. And uh, so, are you a, are you a fan of uh, universal pre K? I think you know you know who wouldn't. I mean, and after all. It, uh, given people working, uh, people need it. Uh, women working, they need it. Yeah. I mean, the, the kind of educational advances that alone will do, I'm not too yeah. beat on. I mean, the studies yeah. don't seem to show that they alone uh, change much in terms of educational advancement. Uh, they do change a, a bit in terms of behavior. Your behavioral outcomes, yeah, that's where you get the indication of a positive effect. Yeah, very, so... Uh, very preschool and all of that. Right. So, you know, that's uh, what I have to say. What about, uh, what about uh, My Brother's Keeper, uh, former President Obama's initiative to try to reach out to young uh, men of color? Sure. I mean, I've been writing for the last two years a number of opinion pieces that focus on uh, occupational training. Uh, I've had just recently a couple of things about certificate programs at public colleges that, uh, you know, the high failure rate at the community college or the academic programs at the community college uh, just lead me to say, uh, Hopefully in a generation or maybe sooner, there won't be as many young black, particularly men, coming out of high school with such limited academic skills. Uh, but that's the reality today. And, uh, and so for that group, uh, they need a positive, the educational system has not been positive for them. And they need something positive. And some of these short-term, six-month to a year certificate training programs give them a step up. And, uh, you know, that's what's needed. Uh, can, so can I just underscore for the audience here that the point is so important. You're saying the main uh, thrust in terms of when you think about educational opportunity is to send kids on from high school to college, maybe via junior college or whatever. That for a significant number of African-American men, especially, they just struggle in school. Uh, the idea that they're going to have a scholastic or academic post-secondary uh, experience that's healthy and productive, that might be a bridge too far for too many of them. And we need to think in more practical terms about how their educational time and how our dollars and resources could be best uh, applied in that population. And you think vocational training one to two year, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but this is what I understand you to be saying, you know, focused on getting a skill that's marketable, uh, getting them ready for the labor market is a, is a smarter way to go than this idea that they're all going to get BAs because actually only 2% of them are going to end up with real BAs at the end of the day. I agree. Okay, so that is one, what you're saying. <laughs> one last point. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's this issue of what do you do when poverty concentrated black neighborhoods. You know, there's a whole constellation of problems, uh, not the least of which is violent crime. And liberals, their approach to this is figuring ways to, to get 
a small share of those poor people into middle class neighborhoods to go to middle class schools where their kids can do better. And the results of those are not very helpful, but even if they were uh, helpful, you're still talking about a small group. And what that essentially says, it directs away from revitalizing those at-risk neighborhoods. Uh, yeah. And I, I just think much more effort has to be directed at what it takes to revitalize, one of which is forming some kind of working alliances with police departments. Yeah. Uh, Hold on just a minute before you go in, and I really want to uh, hear what you want to say about police departments, but you, you were just describing this move to opportunity vision. The Department of Housing and Urban Development some years ago launched a study, carefully designed study to assess whether or not giving uh, housing vouchers to uh, low-income people, allowing them to move out of the concentrated poverty districts of cities would have a beneficial effect. And it's been evaluated and the results have been relatively unimpressive. Um, uh, and you echoed an argument that I've heard Robert Sampson, the very distinguished sociologist at Harvard, make. He says you're treating five or ten percent of the people in the neighborhood as thinking there's going to be some kind of halo effect if you move them over to the middle class. Uh, and you're neglecting the possibility of holistic engagement with the neighborhood as such that would reach a lot more people and would perhaps get more closely to the root of what the, of what the problem is. Because the problem is not about individual persons, but about organic social systems. Something like that. Yeah, and it's also a housing policy. I mean, we have a situation in New York where our mayor, not different than probably other cities, is aggressively trying to get developers in high-end neighborhoods to give a certain amount of their units to uh, lower-income households. And... You know, they would build many, many more units if they didn't have to build them on site. Instead of saying you have to build 20, un 20 of your units have to go to low-income households, they would build 40 units, 50 units or more if they could build those units separately in poorer neighborhoods. That is one of the ways to revitalize poor neighborhoods. It's not simply, you know, better police. That's not unimportant better policing, but it's also to build middle-class housing in poor neighborhoods so that na those neighborhoods begin to have much more of a healthy income distribution than they have now. Uh, and a little bit of that is happening, but uh, because to some extent there aren't many other places where unsubsidized housing is affordable for uh, new housing is affordable for lower middle middle class families, but there could be much more of an effort instead of fighting as hard as possible for another ten or fifteen units in some building somewhere going to poor, and then they usually don't even go to the poor; they go to uh, much more of a, a middle class. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a counterproductive feel-good policy. You know, this is the kind of thing that I think only an economist would appreciate, the kind of insight. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm being a little too uh, uh, laudatory to economists. Maybe not all economists <laughs> would appreciate it, but it's a, it, it strikes me as an economist, a really subtle point, because what you've got is externalities. You've got spillover effects. You've got a heterogeneous population where you have some people who are doing better than other people. And when you're constituting a housing community, a neighborhood, you're creating a, a, a situation where there are going to be spillover effects. Now, uh, people concentrated in poor neighborhoods might be benefited in one of two ways, broadly speaking. One way is to move them out and allow them to enjoy the beneficial effects of living in middle uh, income neighborhoods. And one way to implement a policy like that is to compel developers to include within their developments housing units for people of various income. Another way of trying to help people uh, trapped in concentrated poverty areas would be to get more uh, prosperous and successful people to move into their midst. 
Uh, and one doesn't achieve that by having a middle class housing developer include 10% uh, of his units as low income. One achieves that by, in effect, bribing middle class people to endure, if you'll pardon the language, uh, the negative effects of uh, the sort of environmental externalities of being in a poor neighborhood. Uh, and in that way, uh, generating benefits for all of the poor people who live in those neighborhoods, perhaps, if you can pull it off. Um, and I, I really think that's an interesting contrast. Uh, I want to get uh, poor people the benefit of middle class living. Uh, do I do that by moving a few of them out? And as you say, it's going to be cherry picking. The ones who are going to enroll in the program, manipulate the bureaucracy and uh, uh, realize the benefit of a, a program to move them out are going to be the people within the low income community who were more resourceful, uh, more disciplined, more organized and so on. So they might be the ones least in need of the kind of help that you're offering them. Uh, it's just an interesting thing to think about. We shouldn't talk about this without remembering the history, though. I mean, Remember how difficult it was to site public housing units for low-income people in middle-class neighborhoods, how middle-class neighborhoods resisted fiercely in city after city across the country back in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, the siting of low-income units in their neighborhoods. Um, so, anyway. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, you think there's something wrong with the zeitgeist uh, on these issues? You think race has got something to do with it, I gather. Want to talk about that? Uh... Well, I think, as I've mentioned, there's just a silence among most of the progressives on dealing with any of these issues. And I think, interestingly, the pushback against the Green Book. Uh, the movie. Uh, the movie, The Green Book, winning the Academy Award. And you know, my son has told me, my son, Glenn uh, II, uh, who is a, a left liberal, uh, a very astute uh, observer of American politics. We sometimes talk at the Glenn show. He says he'll never see the movie. He's mad as hell at a movie and he refuses to see it. So well, that's just that's indication of the fact that on the left, there's a lot of antipathy toward that film. And, and, and juxtaposing it with Spike Lee's work. Uh, and it's because I th there's a number of things. One is I think Spike Lee, uh, I have no sympathy for his his do the right thing, which is supposedly was this great movie. It was populated by uh, the worst stereotypes of of blacks in poor communities. Uh, the part he played of Mookie was an irresponsible worker, an irresponsible partner, and an irresponsible father. That's who the main character was in that movie. No one in that movie was making any attempt to better themselves. They were sitting on the street and complaining uh, one guy with a boom box is, is a pretty insulting character and sets off a dynamics. None of them. Radio Rahim. Yes. <laughs> I still of, remember it from 30 years ago, man. No, no. But, you know, and they were all stick, you know, little stick characters, no real development, because Lee is not interested in developing characters having look at evolving relationships, uh, he's got a political agenda. And this was that, uh, you know, look at how racism and white supremacy leads to a hopelessness in black communities. And you have at the end, the culmination is the police killing somebody. But if you look, look at the actual black characters he has in the movie, it reinforces the stereotype that racists hold. Uh, uh, Ru Ruby D and Ozzie Davis would have to be an exception to that, wouldn't they? Ozzie Davis was this pathetic, yeah. sad, drunken mayor of the city. I mean, I don't see where he, okay. he was likable. He was likable. Yeah. But did you have anybody going to school, going to work? Yeah, I hear you. 
Okay, so here's the re- here's this, what the response is going to be to you, uh, somewhat uh, older uh, white curmudgeon. The response is going to be: Lee made the movie he wanted to make, not the movie you wanted him to make. I uh, he's uh, very well; he can make his movie. Yes, yes, there was a political point because there's a political point to be made. Is it the only point? No, it's not the only point. Maybe elsewhere in Lee's au revoir and his, uh, you know, uh, collection of pieces, there you will find uh, more. Uh, in depth treatment. I'm trying to think of where you might look to find that, though. <laughs> yeah, but where you'll find it is in Boys in the Hood, John Singleton's movie, One Year Later. Yeah, okay. It was an incredible, realistic movie of the, of the situation of kids growing up in these at risk neighborhoods. And they're striving. They're people you can be sympathetic to and be sad that. The constraints of the neighborhood pulled them back, pulled them down. Somebody. So your thought is that the that cultural barons like Spike Lee, who communicate to large numbers of Americans and African Americans with a, with a powerful effect, that they really have a responsibility to shape their art in such a way as to address itself either directly or indirectly to the behavioral problems that are holding their people back, rather than to give political. Uh, you know, uh, pep rally type speeches. Yeah, but I'm not even talking about behavioral problems. It's showing positive individuals in the black community. I'm particularly concerned, supposedly they should be about, you don't want to reinforce black, negative black stereotypes. You know, that's a bad thing. But that's what his movie did. And to juxtapose it with Driving Miss Daisy, well, you have this heroic figure of Hope who is systematically shown to be deeply insightful and intelligent, how he has to navigate to uphold his dignity when put in trying situations. This is the Morgan Freeman character. The Morgan Freeman character. If you want, if you want white people who have an instinct to have negative views of black people, the Morgan Freeman character is exactly what you want to present. Now, the, he, it wasn't sugarcoating Jim Crow. And actually, in the Green Book, there's a lot of racism that is shown, it, the viciousness of Jim Crow, particularly in the Green Book. And to just write these movies off as buddy movies, white, black buddy movies. White, just, white savior movies. Uh, respectability politics movies. Well, it go. Uh, Racial reconciliation movies. That's what uh, this this uh, person Wesley Morris, who writes for the Times and and has been in the forefront of this this demonizing of Green Book and Driving Miss Daisy. He says this this fantasy of racial reconcil- reconciliation. Fantasy. Fantasy of it. Uh, but what, again, those movies don't want to do uh, of Spike Lee, uh, they, want, they don't want to show real-life people dealing with real-life problems, how they uh, evolve. He's not into character development. <laughs> He's into well, political... I- <laughs> Okay, I'm not a film critic. Political messaging. I can't really argue with you, but I mean, uh, so is uh, is uh, what's that guy's name? The one who made JFK and uh... no, no, there were other people. I'm not. I mean, what's his name? I I know you know his name. The the the, uh, uh, director I'm talking about, um, who's uh, why am I blocking his name? Um, So you're getting old. That's why. (laughs) (laughs) Oliver Stone, man. No, no, no. He was a, he's not into character development. He's into moving a story along with a certain message. But he's also a great artist. At least I believe, Spike Lee is I believe not a, that he's extremely Spike talented. Lee, for what he does, is very good. It's not the only thing he does. Have you seen Inside Man? No. Okay, this is a Spike Lee uh, joint, uh, which is a straight-up thriller. It's about a bank robber. So, and, and it's beautifully well done. I mean, it's amazing, in my opinion. I mean, it's not, you know, a great, great no, film. No, anyway, but great. let's let's move on. We don't have okay, to let's move on. say what but, I said but, about. But we're, we're talking about control over the culture and the narrative about race. Okay, so it's not as if we really left our uh, uh, left our main uh, script here. Uh, but on the Green Book, 
Um, but what do you think is behind this uh, uh, antipathy uh, to... The antipathy to is, I think for many, particularly for many on the left, if you have a movie that deals with race, you have to show the viciousness of racism. You have to have, like in Black Klansmen, the terrorism of the Klan in uh, 12 Years a Slave, the vicious treatment of black women in Django uh, Unleashed. Unchained. Vicious, what? Django Unchained. Unchained. You have to have the gratuitous, vicious treatment of black sla black men uh, uh, looking at setting up where they sh one's going to kill another. Uh, that's what you have to have if you want to have an effect on whites. You don't have an effect on whites if you simply show good blacks. You know, that's their view. And so if in, you know, Driving Miss Daisy, you have Morgan Freeman, that doesn't mean anything to them. That's go not going to change white racism. What's going to change white racism if they see the viciousness of racism and uh, or of the Klan, as Spike Lee's Black Klansman does. That's what's going to change. Uh, it's making whites feel guilty, basically. Uh, yeah, I don't think I disagree with that, Bob. I would actually add something to it. Uh, yes, it's partly about trying to get your way by framing the racial situation in a way that the whites are the, are the criminal victimizers and blacks are the victims. But I think, there's, I think there's something else that's going on. And I think you see it in this, uh, this vicious antipathy to what is uh, derisively called respectability politics, Anytime somebody says you ought to try to dispel uh, the stereotypes, negative stereotypes that uh, a lot of white people have about blacks by, you know, uh, uh, modifying your behavior in such a way that you're less threatening by projecting images of your people that are more uh, wholesome and, and affirmative. Like Dr. And, and, and the will be The answer will be F-U-C-K that uh, I don't have to genuflect in some altar of white, you know, opinion. And it's, it's a, a problematic posture in my mind because, after all, you actually need white opinion to shift in order to get things done that, that you want to get done. But I think there's another aspect to it, and I think it has to do with shame and embarrassment and humiliation. I think, you know, you're, uh, many African-American intellectuals find ourselves in a situation where the conditions of our people, especially at the low end of the socioeconomic spectrum, are appalling. Uh, the incarceration rates, the school failure, the family uh, instability, and so forth and so on, appalling. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of an embarrassment. Now, just in my saying that, people are going to get mad at me. You know, how dare you say that? Because we have righteously angry because we have been victimized. But the truth of the matter is you have some responsibility about the way that you live. And if you're living poorly, that's partly on you. And uh, when it comes time to show black people living well vis-a-vis -vis living poorly, which is what you wanted to happen, and do the right thing. You wanted affirmative models showing black people living well. That's a tacit acknowledgement of the reality. I don't, I don't say living well, acting well. Okay, acting well, showing them affirming what you're called bourgeois values a while ago. Show them pointing the way for other African Americans about how you can actually make it in this society, notwithstanding the existence of racism. You need That's to. That's exactly you know, what John Singleton did yeah, in Boys in the Hood. And he actually. Yeah was very positive about the Green Book. Uh, I didn't know that, but, I, but that's interesting. No, but do you very see positive about the Green Book. Why people don't want to go down that road because it in a way acknowledges the reality of the dysfunction and it in a way takes on board for black people some of the responsibility of addressing it by pointing over there and saying, you see, that's the way to act. That's the way to relate to your children. That's the way to live. Um, and I think people don't want to do that. Instead, they want to, uh, like, do a one-upsmanship thing. As soon as the conversation starts to get around to that, they want to flip the table over and say, oh, no, 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 racism, racism, which uh, changes the subject, in effect, and uh, it generates some psychological relief for themselves. But again, I would be less hostile 
to the to the kind of liberal view if they at least would seriously in one way or another try to look at ways to address the problem but what we have recently is that what liberals have coalesced around is guaranteed jobs and reparations that is not at a certain macro level in different ways uh, looking past school uh, achievement, neighborhoods, looking past uh, occupational development and so on, and just saying if we should be giving reparations and we should be giving guaranteed jobs. I could go into both of them, but nobody really thinks either one of them has a chance of in any real meaningful way being adopted. Uh, so it's just a divergence and, and trying to say, oh yeah, we're really concerned about black America, this is what we're proposing. Uh, it, 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 Let me ask you a question. Uh, guaranteed jobs, you know, I'm, I'm an economist, you're an economist uh, uh, in a country of uh, 350 million people or whatever it is, uh, the idea with labor force of 180 million or whatever it is, that the, uh, the, the government is going to be an employer of last resort such that everybody who's not employed otherwise, everybody who's not employable otherwise will be getting the government check. That sends a chill down my spine. I haven't tried to price it out, but it looks like it's going to be a large sum. Well, particularly because they're pricing those jobs at 30000 a year plus very generous benefits. Okay. Uh, so, and, so I see the problem with that. Now, but, but, but suppose I said I got, a, you know, I got an infrastructure plan here. It's $700 billion over 10 years, and we're going to do roads and bridges and whatnot. And I'm going to take... 10 billion of that 700 billion, and I'm going to devote it to um, uh, trying to expand employment opportunities for hard to employ people. I'm going to try to work with trade unions, get some of these youngsters into apprenticeships. I'm going to try to, uh, you know, take on people who might have a criminal record or some other kind of blemish and would otherwise be difficult to employ and, and give them jobs as laborers and whatnot. We can argue about what the wage is going to be. I agree with you. The unions are going to want the wage to be maybe twice what it should be and whatever. We're going to have to sort that out. <laughs> But would you, in principle, be opposed to government initiatives that had an employment component to them? I'm not um, at all. A, I yeah. mean, in fact, I've done some studies that looked at reentry programs. Yeah. And some of them do exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. But that's not what this guaranteed jobs yeah. is about because they don't want, they explicitly don't want them to be construction jobs because those are male. They want them to be... Right civil, you know, public service kind of jobs. Uh, and, but they really, but the, but the point is that he, that the real issue economists see today is that people who don't have jobs now don't have them because they don't have the right hard skills or soft skills to be employed. There are jobs out there wanting, and therefore the question is training. What kind of training? I think it should be certificate programs and the like, but what kind of training programs can the government set up? Some of them can be with the trade unions for apprenticeship programs, but it ends up that these many of the better paying apprenticeship programs need people with pretty decent math skills. And so they're not, uh, you know, security guards uh, are, are much easier to train people for. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, it's a training issue. Yeah. It's not guaranteed jobs. It's a training issue that you have to pull people up who don't necessarily have the right either soft skills or hard skills for very modest jobs. What's your problem with reparations, uh, Robert? 
Why well, not? Why not? The wealth gap. Have you seen the wealth gap? You know what happened to housing in America in the mid 20th century? Black people got squeezed out. Various ways of ethnics came here. They, the are, certainly... they got incorporated into the engine of uh, mobility. African-American uh, descendants of slaves are left behind. Uh, last hired, first fired, segregated neighborhoods, segregated schools. What's I don't wrong know, with I, My argument against it <laughs> is, is that it can't be, it just can't be operational and, and give any reasonable amount of money. The, the more credible uh, subset is what are called baby bonds. That is, every kid that's born gets twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars that's put in an account that they get when they're twenty-one years old. This is an idea, by the way. Excuse me for interrupting. Being pushed by William Darity, Sandy Darity, the economist that do. Yes, yes, he's uh, he's also pushed the the reparations. Yeah, I, I know, but we're talking about baby bonds now, and I just right, wanted, right. To, so I just wanted to do acknowledgement as as pushing this idea. No, no, I we both know him quite well. Yeah. Uh, it's not unreasonable on the surface, but the problem is, let's say you, you, we agree on 25,000. Uh, first of all, it's really a class issue because it's going to go to everyone. Yeah. And therefore it's really primarily helping on a class basis, not a race basis. I have no problem with that. And I don't think Sandy ultimately does. Maybe, you could give a little bit more for yeah. whatever. But the problem is how that money is going to be used. These are going to kids in struggling families. You think those families want to wait 21 years to use some of that money? What happens if there's a health problem in the family? What happens if taking some of the money, their kids can go to a better school? You know, let's say I know what's going to happen. Payday lender type guys are going to come into this marketplace and advance you <laughs> a certain percentage of your entitlement. And then uh, you're going to be implicitly paying 15 or 20 percent per annum on that money uh, in order to. No, but, no, but these are That's even if there wasn't. No, I think there will be escape clauses that you can use the money for some educational goods even before the kid is 21. Yeah. You know, there'll be certain kinds but ultimately, those resources are going to be used much earlier than the 21. And so it's basically another, you know, you might as well just increase the child credit instead of it being uh, what it is now, I think, 1,000 or 2,000 a child, you increase it more uh, because you're just going to have to make families jump through hopes to use that money sooner than when the kid's 21. Okay, and, then, and it's legitimate. Many of those uses uh, would be quite legitimate to use. Okay, there, there could be some problem with baby bonds, but we were talking before about reparations, and you say it's just not politically in the cards. And I'm wondering if it's even worse than that, if trying to get it, you fail politically, and you also engender a lot of resentment from people who think the whole uh, framing of the claim is is wrong. That you know, I'm thinking of white people who say, "I don't owe you anything. I didn't do anything to you." Well, I think it's going to end up that virtually all of the Democratic nominees Looks are going like to backpedal. From oh, you it. think they're going to backpedal? Well, they say it's a goal. They'll start saying, "Well, it's a goal," and then they'll go into something along the lines of baby bonds. You know, something along the lines of giving a more class based. Uh, wealth to uh, appropriate groups. Uh, I, I just don't see this going anywhere. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of issues. Who's going to qualify? Who doesn't qualify? Uh, it, it's just a bankruptcy, I think, of democratic thought where these democratic politicians you know, whether it's, uh, you know, just a list of... Uh, they're pandering. I think they actually... Yeah, Bob, I, I think... Nothing, I, they have I nothing to offer. Yeah. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's an intellectual difficulty. I, I, I agree that it's bankrupt, in my opinion, but I don't think it's because people just don't know any better. They're pandering. I think they know better in their pandering. Um, and my, they're pandering to black mass voters 
whom they hope to swing to their side in the South Carolina primary and, and wherever else in order to get this nomination. They're trying to make sure that they don't get what happened to Bernie Sanders out in Oakland at some uh, political meeting where Black Lives Matter stood up in, in front of him or what happened to Hillary Clinton when she lost some black support because her husband was president of the United States between 1992 and 2000. They don't want that to happen to them. They're trying no, to get right. wait, 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 Let me finish. When Elizabeth Warren says, she said this in New Orleans to the speech to a black uh, audience, the criminal justice system is racist from front to back. I actually don't think she believes that. I think she's pandering. And, and for me, the reparations pandering is dangerous because it might succeed, even though it's unlikely to succeed. And were it to succeed, it would have commodified and discharged the historic obligation that the country has to address itself to the continuing problems of African-Americans by creating an event in which you Negroes, pardon me, have been paid by creating uh, a break such that, all right, you got your, and like you said, it's not going to be any real money anyway. You got your $25,000 ahead. How long is that going to last? How much is that going to do? And yet the whole country will be able to say, we put that behind us now. I don't know what you're talking about. You tell me you got black poverty, you got blacks in prison. What are you talking about? You've been paid. You've been paid. And I think that's a disastrous development for African-Americans. It, it, the whole thing is wrongheaded. It avoids citizenship. It avoids the fact that we're all in this together, that the obligations are open-ended, that they can't be commodified and they can't be discharged by a quid pro quo, and that we have to do politics. We have to live together as one people in the United States of America, not as competing groups who are making uh, – <laughs> who are negotiating compensatory transfers between one another. So it's, it's wrong at its root, not just because it's a pragmatic thing. And I think a lot of people know it, but they're pandering. No, no, it's true. I mean, uh, but we'll, you know, we'll just see. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. not, it's not pleasant to think about. <laughs> All right, Bob, you want to uh, wrap it up here? You got anything else you want to say on this round of our ongoing conversation? Uh, not, not really. I mean, I think uh, it just would be more hopeful if, if people who have real concerns, like you talked about uh, your son, I, well, yeah, one my of my son Chicago works... Oh, Alden. Uh, Alden. Alden works around trying to develop uh, the m kind of micro policies that I'm talking about. I mean, yeah. he's not he's not one of these political actors uh, on stage, yeah. but he's getting his hands dirty. And it would be more hopeful if many of these people who are doing the real work of trying to change situations if they had more voice in what occurs uh, because you know I think anyone who has a realistic understanding of what's going on in at-risk black neighborhoods knows that you have to find a way to work with the police to solve problems you have to find ways to work with families in their homes to move ahead that it's uh, it's not these grandiose uh, policies at some macro level that things have to be done at the state and local level if there's going to be changes and you know the government should be investing money but more wisely at this at these local levels in the kinds of policies that can be effective yeah, I, I just want to add here, I want people to know I have two sons who have been guests on the Glenn Show whom Robert has seen. One is my younger son, Glenn II, and the other, my older son, Alden. Alden is in Chicago. He's, uh, as you say, getting uh, his hands dirty working in communities on uh, these kind of issues. Uh, and Glenn lives here in, in suburban Boston. Uh, I just don't want my sons to get uh, mixed up with the <laughs> in, in people's minds. I got to ask you something, Bob, since I have you here, we're closing out. But uh, you showed me an essay that you had written about uh, early 20th century American popular theater and about blackface <laughs> and, and about the role of certain uh, people like Al Jolson and Eddie Cantor and, and others, uh, Sophie Tucker and others, 
in the in this uh, part of American popular culture. Many of these people were Jewish about their relationships to African Americans, about where they stood politically and whatnot. And I'm wondering, I don't mean to uh, put you in a uh, embarrassing position, but I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit in uh, light of more recent political events where people caught in blackface have been, uh, you know, in Virginia uh, asked to step out of their positions, uh, just a kind of the history of it, because uh, on reading your essay, I came away thinking, uh, you know, I used to see that Al Jolson, that uh, sort of iconic photo of Al Jolson, you know, with his arms like like that. Mammy, <laughs> mammy, how I love him, how I love <laughs> exactly. him. Exactly. And, and I just assimilated to my general revulsion to, uh, you know, the minstrelsy uh, scene, which I know very little about in detail. And I got the impression that there was more subtlety there than meets the eye. And I wonder if you want to want to say anything about that. Well, what I want to say is that what people find most reprehensible about blackface is really 19th century blackface. That in the second, third, and fourth decade of the 20th century, blackface was much, much different. You had some regressive, but the dominant role of blackface uh, was in fact uh, if anything, playing against the stereotype. So uh, Eddie Cantor had a routine when he was he was this effete black man. He was almost like Dr. Shirley. Uh, and uh, but Al Josen in particular was one of the most beloved entertainers in the black community. He, his movies sold out. He he was fetid he wasn't fetid but he was honored by the black actors union when he died they sent a memorial he was he was beloved because his films the characters were in no way the kind of negative stereotypes and he did a lot for black entertainers i mean he was in the forefront in the teens and the 20s and getting blacks into stage, uh, his own performances, but others, black writers getting their works produced. He socialized with blacks. Uh, so Eddie Cantor was loved by the, by the black community. Uh, in my writings, I have something where he's, he's seen at the Apollo Theater in the, in the audience, and he's called up. And he goes on for, they wouldn't let him come off the stage. They just wanted him to perform and perform. Uh, performing black, in blackface? No, but okay, black, just performing, yeah. yeah. But black comedians at yeah. the Apollo up through the early 40s, black comedians performed in blackface at the Apollo Theater to black audiences. And at the NCCP had a fight to get them to stop doing it. So, I mean, it was a certain time period where blackface didn't mean what it meant in the 1890s, and it doesn't mean what, it, what people think it means today. I mean, I do think there's some distinction between dressing up as Diana Ross and, or dressing up in a derogatory black stereotype of yeah. blackface. But, you know, maybe... It's a past thing, and people yeah. just shouldn't do it. Uh, but, that would be my advice. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, you know, the kind of way it's being pictured uh, really does damage to the real history of blackface, these two different eras of the 19th century and the early, mid-20th century. Okay, thanks for sharing. Thanks for coming on the Glenn Show. Appreciate well, your time. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, give out my email so I can get uh, some. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just kidding. If you want to write your email in the first comment in the comment section, no, also, no, I know, I know, I know. You go ahead. Anyway, and do that. <laughs> good health. And to you. you and your family. Take care of yourself, my friend. Bye.